Well, if you will, open your Bibles to the 25th division of Psalm, Psalm 25, Psalm 25. While you're looking there in Psalm 25, I, um, want to reiterate in our, into our hearing while you're finding Psalm 25, Jeremiah chapter 29, where you have heard me mentioned, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. The NIV says, I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a future and a hope. But then it goes on to say, then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you and you shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart, not a part of it, but with all of your heart. And he says, I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. I'm going to bring you out of your deliverance. I'm going to bring you out of the thing that has bound you. I'm going to bring you out of your sorrow. I'm going to bring you out of your depression. I'm going to bring you through your divorce. I, I, I'm, I'm going to deliver you out of everything that has ever plagued your life. And I will gather you from all the nations and from all of the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you to the place from which I cause you to be carried away captive. But what a blessed hope and promise of God that he has given to us that we will find him when we seek for him with all of our hearts. God says, I know the plans I've got for you. There are plans to prosper you and not to harm you. There are plans to give you a hope at the future. And he says, I'm going to tell it to you. I don't want to withhold it, but I'm going to let you know when you seek me with all of your heart, I, 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 you'll, I'll be found by you. And so you won't just search forever and forever. The Bible's promises, seek and ye shall find. You ask and it shall be given. You knock and it shall be opened unto you. There's something that God is going to do in the midst of us. As we seek him, I think you're going to find him in ways that you have never known him before in all of the days of your life. And what you're going to discover is that life is not merely like a fine glass of wine because when you're drinking wine, the more you drink, the less you've got left. But really life is more like a good book that the more, the further you get along in it, the better you understand the characters, the better defined they are the greater clarity that you have about what's going on. You begin to see the full picture. You ever notice how sometimes a movie will open and it'll show you the end with somebody being shot or this person waking up out of a coma or something in, the, in a car wreck and then they go back and show it to you and it leads back up to that point. Well, see, God declares the end of a thing from the beginning thereof. And so he already knows the expected end, the future, the hope that he's already established for us. And, uh, and I want you to know that it, it, it gets better as it goes along. That's why I say with all of the conviction in my heart and believing it that the best is yet to come. Because God's never going to leave you in a low place. He's not going to end on a negative. God always ends on a positive. He lifts us out of it. Death is a, is a negative, but when God raises us, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead will quicken your mortal bodies. He raises us up, and I'm here to tell you that God's going to lift you up. There are many raptures that will happen. You get down, and God will lift you up. He'll lift you up out of your, your, your pit, out of your despair, out of your discouragement. He will lift us up out of the muck and the miry clay. He lifts us into places where we have never been before, and it gets greater as you go along. And I just want you to know that God has a plan, and he wants to share it with you when you seek him with all of your heart. Well, I was just sharing that as an appetizer while you found Psalm 25. 
And uh, notice verse 3, this is David who's crying out to God and he says, indeed, verse 3, let no one who waits on you be ashamed. That word ashamed is also translated as disappointed. Let nobody who waits on the Lord be disappointed. And he said, let those be ashamed who deal treacherously without cause. You ever notice that sometimes some people will just do some things against you and you never even did anything to them? He said, let them be ashamed who deal treacherously without cause. And notice where David is crying out to God saying, show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. On you I will wait all the day. There's a waiting that is involved that is a part of the process of God developing us. There are certain things that you have to wait on. Let him that minister wait on his ministry, her ministry. There is a waiting because God is in the process of maturing something in us, getting us ready, getting us prepared for that moment, the day of visitation. There's something about the waiting, that anticipation of certain things that begin to happen and are released in us. Notice verse 8. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he teaches sinners in the way. Do you know that God even teaches sinners in the way? The humble he guides in justice, and the humble he teaches his way. That's why God will exalt the humble, but he will abase the proud. So when people are prideful, you know what? God can't lead, lead them. He can't teach them. They know it all. Pride is the strength of sin. You try to tell prideful people things and uh, they won't receive you because of their pride. They'll be wrong as two left shoes and still rationalizing. Say rationalize. rationalize. And listen to it real carefully. Rational lies. <laughs> it's still a lie any way you look at it. When you rationalize, you are simply trying to justify wrong thinking or wrong actions. Generally, rationalization is justifying wrong. When you find people rationalizing, well, see, it ain't even like that. You are trying to justify something that's wrong. Yet they're using their thinking. They know that way deep down, they know that they are a low-down scoundrel. They know it. They just don't want to admit it. You know what keeps people from admitting that? Pride. It is the strength of sin. You see, a proud person, they have problems allowing people to help them because they act like they know it all. And you cannot teach a man a lesson that he thinks he already knows. So his pride says, don't let them know. That's why, you know, it's, it is so difficult for us as men uh, to, to stop and ask for directions, uh, me included. I'll be going, no, no, let's just keep going. I just hate to do that. You know, when you see me break down, I, it's because I've gotten tired of driving. <laughs> I'm so grateful for GPS systems. I don't know what in the world to do. That, that has been a lifesaver for men because, you know, men just be like, you're, that's all right, I got this. You, you just sit over there and look, who, who driving? <laughs> I'm so glad for GPS system that we don't have to stop and ask for direction. But the humble he guides in justice and the humble he teaches his way. There's something about humility. God loves humility, brokenness, contrition of heart when we sit down and make ourselves teachable. One of the greatest joys to a teacher is for people to be hungry for what the teacher has. It's one of the greatest joys. It is one of the most frustrating things in the world to be able to teach someone something and they not have an appetite for what you know. And so it is God who teaches the humble his way. If we need the direction of God, if we are in a position 
God wants us to humble ourselves. If my people, 2 Chronicles 7 14, which are called by my name, would do what? Humble themselves. Because God is saying, I can't even help them unless they have a spirit of humility. That's why God has to let some of us just run our head into a brick wall so many times, just waiting for us to be humble. You know, he, he, I mean, we're on a rope anyway. You, you're really on a leash. You think that you're free to do what you want to do, and you know, children think, they think that they're free and that they're running out in rebellion, doing their own, they're on a leash. It's like you, you, he's already got you hooked, and uh, he's just giving you some line. And uh, when he gets good and ready, he, he's, he'll reel it in once you stop fighting. You know, when, when a fish, a, fish are so strong when they're in the water, when they are in their element. I went out deep sea fishing and these were amberjack, these huge fish, and boy, they were so strong. I'm standing in the center of the boat. They were so strong that they literally dragged me over to the side of the, of the boat. I started to turn loose that pole because I'm like, I'm not coming over there. <laughs> That's one thing I knew. I was not going into that territory. You know, you ask the question, who wins between an alligator and a bear? And the answer is, it depends on where they fight. If they fight in the water, the alligator will win. If they fight on the land, the bear will win. And I knew that I was not going into that territory. So God teaches the humble and he guides them. When we need the guidance of the Lord, he's just waiting for us to come and say, you know what, Lord, I've tried this thing my way. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm lost. I'm in deep water now. I, I thought that I had it all figured out, but I didn't know that this was going to happen to the economy. I never knew that this would happen to my relationship. I never knew that the very child that I gave birth to and nurtured would ever rise up and talk back to me and be disrespectful. God. I don't have all of the answers now. I need you. Lord, I never knew that I would deal with a chemical addiction in my home. I never knew, God, that I'd have to go down to a courthouse and watch a son or a daughter be incarcerated. I never knew that I'd have to see my child in shackles. God, what do you do when life has led you into some strange directions, when you never thought that they would ever, that precious little baby that God gave you that, that you'd be having trouble with them at the school? What do you do when you get to these positions and then parents become then frustrated out of their wits because they don't know what to do? It's not for us to act like we know it all. It's for us to be able to fall at the mercy of God and say, God, I don't know what else to do. I humble myself before you. If my people, which are called by my name, would humble themselves. And one of the reasons why God wants us to humble ourselves is so that he can guide us and teach us his way, teach us his way. We know our way, we don't know his way. And we need to know what he knows because God says, I know, not I think, not I guess, not I, uh, maybe that this will work. God says, I know the plans that I have for you. They're plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a future and a hope. God says, I know it, I know it. And he said, and I'll let you know it when you seek me with all of your heart. And you see, God never forces us. He never forces. He gets out in front and he leads us and that means that we as an act of our own will have to choose to follow him. The devil gets behind us and pushes us and gives us compulsions and, and addictions and he drives us. But the Holy Spirit is very gentle. He gets out in front. And he says, this is the way walk you in it. And we have to follow him, follow him. So notice that the humble he guides in justice. When you really need to be guided by God, there is a humility of heart that must come into us. And the humble he teaches his way. Now look down at verse 14. The secret of the Lord is with those who fear him and he will show them his covenant. There's something about humility and there's something about the fear of the Lord because remember the fear of the Lord is also the beginning of what? Wisdom. Wisdom. Wisdom is knowing how to do it God's way. God wants his people to have his wisdom. 
And so we are so grateful to God. I mean, I want to show you something over in, uh, in 1 John, 1 John chapter 2. That's little John now, not, not St. John. St. John is big John. In 1 John, you know, over toward Revelation, 1 John chapter 2. I want you to see this, 1 John chapter 2. And this is in reference to the deceptions of the last day, of the last, uh, the, the, toward the end, end of time. Notice in 1 John chapter 2, in beginning with verse 18, notice these words, little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, remember Christ, Christos, is anointing. The Antichrist is the anti-anointing, anything that's against the anointing of God. Even now, many Antichrists have come. A lot of folks that don't like the anointing and don't welcome the anointing into their lives. By which we know that is the last hour because of people fighting the anointing of God. And they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. But notice verse 20. This is what we want to get to. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. You have an anointing, an unction, an unction on the inside of you from the Holy One, and you know all things. And he says, I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. How do you know that? Have you ever had people telling you something and something on the inside of you says, that's a bunch of baloney? <laughs> I, I, you, you, know what I'm, you know when sometimes when people are just saying things to you and you know this is, this is not what it's about at all? Because you have an anointing, you have an unction on the inside of you that says, this is the truth. This is the truth. We have an anointing on the inside of us, that unction of the Holy Spirit that says, this is the real deal. I know truth when I hear it. Something on the inside of us, you have an unction, an unction. Now, there are times that we might even call that unction, that anointing, we may call that intuition. Say intuition. intuition. You know what intuition means? It means inner teacher. You go to school teachers when you have to pay tuition, don't you? Intuition is inner teacher. You have an inner teacher of the Holy Ghost, an inner teacher, intuition. Now, intuition is not something that you learn in school. You get it through a discernment by your inner teacher. There's something about the inner teacher on the inside that'll tell you, go this way, don't go that way, don't deal with this. And how did you know that? It was your inner teacher. It's your inner teacher. The inner teacher says, don't go in this neighborhood. Your inner teacher says, it's time to leave the party. It's your inner teacher. Your inner teacher says, you had enough. Your inner teacher says, don't eat that. Your, your inner teacher says, you might need to drink more water. It may not seem supernatural, but it's your inner teacher. How did you know it? You knew it by intuition. You, you get a bad feeling about a person. You get a bad vibe, and you, you know that. I, I, you know, they're saying all the right thing, but something ain't right. I, I can't put my finger on it. Your inner teacher is saying, you know what? Now, they may be fooling your head, but, but they're not fooling me. Your inner teacher is saying, you better watch them. Your inner teacher will say, don't, don't let your child go around this person. If that's your inner teacher. Uh, intuition, your inner teacher. Now, I'm talking about the Holy Spirit who indwells your spirit. That You've got an inner teacher, an unction from the Holy One who abides on the inside of us so that he can teach us. See, it's all again about teaching so he can teach us his way. He said, I've, I've not left you comfortless, but he has given us the Holy Spirit. Did you know Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 27 talks about the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord searching all the inward parts of the belly. In other words, God uses man's own spirit to light the path for him. 
It's that inner teacher again. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. God says, I'll use your spirit. I'll set a light on your spirit. And it's the Holy Spirit that becomes that light. It's like that, that, that flame, that same flame that came and sat on, on their heads on the day of Pentecost. That, 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 there was a sound of a mighty rushing wind. You're always going to, when, when it comes with God, uh, you, you, you're going to feel something and then you'll see something. They, 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 they heard the sound of the, of the wind and then they saw these cloven tongues like as a fire that sat upon each of them. Well, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. God was lighting the candle. And when the candle is lit, now you've got light in the house. And so he's searching all the inward parts. He's our discerner. He knows things, that, that inner teacher again. There's something that you don't need anybody to teach you because the inner teacher knows, you know, that, you know what? And it's like, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. You, you, you know, that's freakish. <laughs> and you didn't have to read it in a book. Your inner teacher said, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. No, that, that's crazy. That's downright nasty. Nobody taught you that. <laughs> that inner teacher. You got an in touch your neighbor, say, thank God for the inner teacher. <laughs> Look over at St. John chapter 16. You all don't mind walking in the scriptures, do you? St. John chapter 16. This is Big John. St. John chapter 16. Because I want you to see the, the present ministry of the Holy Spirit in leading and guiding the people of God. We saw in Psalm 25 how David was crying out, God, lead me, guide me, show me the path, the way I need to know. St. John chapter 16, let's, let's look at verse 5. And all of this, as you'll notice, is in red, this indicating these are the words of Christ. And he says in St. John chapter 16, verse 5, but now I go away to him who sent me, and none of you ask me where you're going. But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin. Notice this, the Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin, singular, S-I-N, not S-I-N-S, not sins. He will convict the world of sin. You know why of sin and not sins? Because there's only one sin that actually takes you to hell, only one. It is the sin of rejecting Jesus as Savior. So notice, when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Notice verse 9, of sin because they do not believe in me. Here's that sin of rejecting Christ because they do not believe in me. Verse 10, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. And 11, of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. And he goes on to tell them, I have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he, again, that unction on the inside of you, will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. Now remember, faith is actually the vision of God. And we're talking about releasing your faith because I want to teach you five distinct ways in which to release your faith. You can have faith in your heart, but faith in your heart won't get the job done until you release it out. Uh, how do you disseminate the faith of the living God? Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. And you can have these feelings, you can have this faith on the inside, but how do I release it out into my situation? How do I activate this thing? It's, it's almost like having adrenaline on the inside of you. How do I engage my adrenaline? I need the strength of my adrenaline to get me through this. How do I, how do I engage it? 
That's what I want to teach you, is how to release your faith and see God has to show us paths. He, he will show us the way. God will show you the way. He knows the way. He is the way. So remember, faith, without faith, it is impossible to please him. Faith is the vision of God. Now, when I say faith is the vision of God, I simply mean faith is seeing as God sees. It is seeing as God sees. When you have faith, faith always sees something. You don't really believe it unless you can see it. Faith sees the vision of God. It, it sees it. It sees it. Faith always sees something. I mean, he'll give you a frontal view. We call that self-reflection. Think of it as standing in the mirror. There are certain things that you can see of yourself, but you have to see it through a mirror. You, you can't even see yourself without seeing yourself through a reflection. Self-reflection. A mirror gives us self-reflection. Then you see yourself uh, through the eyes of others. Others have to actually show you. And when others see you, they're given a rear view. You, you're in the mirror, but they can see you from behind. You can't even see your back. Others have to see that and tell you what you look like in the back. You get a rear view. It gives a reflection. There are some things about you that you'll never be able to see unless others see it and show you about you. You don't really know how you come off to people. You really don't. I mean, you think that you're a nice person, then some out of all of a sudden come out of the clear blue and say, hey, you, no, 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 you're a control freak. <laughs> no, 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 you, you dominate the conversation. You don't ever let a person get a word in edgewise. And you won't even see yourself that way. You, no, 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 I'm not like that. You have to get a rear view from others because there's a side of you that you can't even see in the mirror. There's a dimension of you that you actually need others. Thank you for watching Power for Living with Bishop Dale C. Bronner. Until next time, God bless you.